good good morning everyone uh, uh, me and my teammates see you and you yang we are from western university and uh, the lessons learned case study today is about mila viaduct uh, this bridge that you see in front of you is the tallest bridge in the world uh, it was designed by uh, michael villusher and the uh, architect was sir norman foster uh, the project manager for this project was john pierre martin and uh, this project was constructed by IFH, the same firm uh, that constructed the Eiffel Tower. We're going to go through a little bit of background and then some of the objectives of Mila Viaduct, and then we will look at some of the lessons and we will summarize them. This is the Roman aqueduct of Pondogard. Now, aqueducts were built by the Roman Empire to uh, carry water into their cities. Uh, viaducts have evolved from aqueducts with over, over 2,000 years of progress in between them. Uh, and over 200 kilometers to the west of this uh, Pondugard lies the uh, tallest aqueduct in the city of Milau. Now, uh, why Milau? Because in 1980, French government authorized a freeway connecting Paris to Spain. And this freeway, it, it stopped dead when it reached the city of Milau because uh, it, it hit the valley of River Tharn. And this caused all the traffic to go back into the city of Milau. And as it passed through the city of Milau, it caused a lot of havoc. And there was uh, 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 the reputation of Milau was getting tarnished. As you can see, these are the words of the mayor, Jack Scottrain. And uh, the reasons are very clear why the bridge was required. The objectives of Milau Viaduct, it is, it, it, it is a multi-purpose project. It started off as uh, a reason to suppress the summer traffic, but it also had to be resourceful and develop the country as well as the local town. And it had to be exceptional both in terms of technical and aesthetic. I'm going to sort of walk you through the construction pro process very quick here. First, the piers had to be, had to be constructed. And then uh, we, then they sort of slid the freeway across the piers at 270 meter above the ground level, and this was done through a hydraulic mechanism, which will be explained. And uh, as the as the freeway went through, this this is the this is the point where the freeway met midway in the air, and uh, this and it it met with the precision of just two centimeters. So it was a very big feat achieved for the construction team as well as the project management team. Uh, and this project has been a success. Let's look at some of the uh, lessons that we have to be learned from here. F at first, it was decided that Milau Viaduct is going to be a publicly funded project. But in 1998, the Communist Minister of Transport, he announced that uh, they are looking for private funding. Uh, there, are, there are many reasons for it. Basically, it's the lack of public funding available. And uh, the negotiation that happened between, uh, between uh, IFEJ as well as the authorities uh, has a lot of lessons. Firstly, uh, negotiations have to be a win-win type situation. Both the entities should go back home thinking that they have won something. And secondly, if, you are, if, you're pro pro if as a concessionary you're providing a concession, you should not just give in. And that's exactly what, Mila, uh, what IFEJ did. Uh, it, it included 75 years of concession period in its company proposal. And also, there was seasonal variation of tolls. 20% more tolls was collected during the summer months, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, IFIJ knew exactly what the government wanted. They wanted someone who could privately fund the project, as well as someone who would give a concession at a very affordable rate to the public. So they went in with their plans, and they knew what the other side wanted. And it was a very quick negotiation. For It, it, it lasted a month. And at the end of the negotiation, IFIJ agreed to complete the project in 38 months and with a budget of 320 million euros. 300 was for the bridge, and 20 was for the toll, the toll plaza. Uh, risk management. There was a risk which was assessed in the geological assessment. And uh, the risk was of the uh, landslide. The, the, there is lam this limestone rock found in this area. And this area is prone to very big landslides. And this risk was simply ignored. 
there was a storm well into the construction. And uh, as you can see, there are around 4,000 cubic meters of rock that is found at, the, at Pier 1. So precious manpower and labor had to be diverted during the construction phase to fix this issue, as well as make sure that uh, another land, landslide does not affect the project. But if it was already identified in the risk assessment plan, then the risk management plan should have had mitigation strategies uh, in place so that they would be able to deal in case such situation comes up. The management of financial risk by the private concessionary is a very interesting thing about this project. Uh, firstly, IFEJ had 75 years of concession period and they had higher toll rates. This, th this had done some work for them, but the war was far from over. They had to self-finance the whole project, as in buy, in buy the whole project in corporate, and they had to show fund funds of 300 million euros. IFEJ at that time just had 150 million euros of cash flow. They didn't want to go to the banks because bank would evaluate their investment as a high risk. It was the tallest bridge in the world after all. So they came up with a new strategy. They negotiated with a bank called Natsis, and they gave a guarantee of their 150 million euros in exchange. Uh, I mean, they froze the 150 million euros in the, in, in the bank in exchange for 300 million euros at that time and paid a low interest rate of 0.37% for the extra 150 million euros. Now, this was an innovative way of funding the project as they, they were not bound uh, to involve their risk management plan in this. And they, they did not stop at this. They, were, uh, they went ahead to brainstorm and identify future opportunities with which they can reduce their current financial risk. One of the... Uh, Strategies employed by them was all the steel scaffoldings that was used for the project was sold back after the project. And this was already evaluated before the project even started. And another thing that they did was they had a plan of selling back after some years some stakes of uh, their, I mean, some of their stakes in the Milau Viaduct back to the public organizations. And this was realized two years later when they sold 49% of their stakes to a public organization. And uh, there had to be an amendment which had to be included in the contract for this to happen. But the amendment was allowed because it is a public organization which is uh, specialized in long-term investments. And uh, with this, they made 770 million euros just after two years. And this is how they managed their financial risk. Now I would like Ziyu to take over and explain the next lessons. Thank you, Rohit. And uh, I will talk about uh, the lessons that in risk management uh, is about when implementing a new technology, risk management plan for every possible scenario should be in place. And uh, as we could see in the white picture, uh, in the system there are two wedges, the blue one and the red one. And the two wedges are hydraulic wedges that could move on top of each other, that could lead the deck in a sliding motion and due to a layer of teflon. However, uh, the launching system was a prototype which was never tested. And after six months of launching, the two surfaces of teflon coating on the prototype wore out. And uh, since there was no backup plan, the deck system failed. It was a uh, a very it, it was a disaster because uh, that uh, hand the deck in the air by suffering strong wind around 85 kilometers per hour. And uh, since the system has been halted, uh, this caused delay in the launching in process. Although this was a bad prototype, uh, this was an excellent lesson in leadership and uh, inventory management uh, because this all have, could have been prevented. And uh, instead of launching new system, the team found that they could uh, use the inventory management uh, versus uh, procure management to get fast and efficient results. And they used the NASA's approach with Apollo 13 as their guiding star and uh, did the inventory management 
at last the team found that they had undermined the stress between the wedge surfaces. So the team make use of Teflon that other launching machines that were not yet used. At last they fixed that issue and the launch restarted within 20 hours of the halt. And uh, in the quality management, uh, the lesson we could learn is it is important to make sure the quality of Milau viaduct within limited font and time. First, the construction of deck pylons, piers, the is and the assembling of the deck is all in-house, which means if it have direct supervision. The all in-house means that uh, the if it and the all is uh, subsidiaries, like one team, f you, one team is for the electricity, one is for the uh, uh, one is for the coating, and they are all in house. And the other strategy was used uh, to uh, meet the punishing time uh, schedule. Is there are two uh, ro ro welding robots are used uh, to cut the steel. Uh, the plasma cutting machine, a program to automatically blaze its way through the deal. This could uh, dramatically and decrease the cutting time. Now I will introduce Yu Yang to continue. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Let me continue. So for the human resource management, management, uh, it is pretty good to split one major project to uh, several small projects, and the leadership rotation is really useful for the huge project. And there, for this project, there are 600 employees on site at any given time for 39 months. So there are really a lot of people together for such a long time. And, and first of all, the security me measure must be included in the staffing management. And the company separated the construction of uh, buildings and the piers into nine separated projects, each with a unique team and a foreman. And besides that, the company used the leadership rotation and uh, uh, each foreman took a responsibility for some small, uh, some small projects for several months. And after that, the, uh, they were exchanged to an another projects for se another several months. And uh, uh, because of the leadership uh, rotation, the company can make sure that the leader from different parts of this bridge uh, ha leadership for the bridge can appreciate the importance of the Importance, uh, importance of each sub project, and this also could challenge and motivate staff to uh, pro perform better. And for the stakeholder management, the stakeholder appoints representatives who represent their interests and involved in the decision making process. For this program, uh, for this project, there are three main stakeholders. One is the uh, French government. And there are three directors of the road was involved from the beginning to the end. And uh, the second one includes SETC and SNCF. They were hired by French government and they were uh, and independent of the FH. Uh, they were, their responsibility is, check, is to check the, the quality of the bridge, uh, satisf uh, whether it satisfies the standards and uh, gave the permission to continue the work. And the second part of, of the second part is the FH. Uh, it is an execution company and uh, of course they have a lot of small parts of this company to do different jobs. And for the time management, one way to accelerate uh, activities is by changing uh, the working method employed for the activities. For this project, it, it is uh, complete several weeks ahead of the schedule. And it can be achieved by the importing, uh, importing, tech, uh, importing strategies and the resource le leveling. So uh, if they, according to reference, if they choose, they choose concrete to build the decades, it would be uh, 52 math in total, uh, which is far more delayed compared to 42 math uh, for the steel options. And there are several more advantages for the steel options. Uh, the, for the steel options, the decades and the piers can be built at the same time uh, because the concrete must be mixed or 
uh, produce on site. And, but uh, the steel pieces can be prefabricated in factories. And uh, what's more, the, the steel decades can be assembled on the piers, at the, each piers. And uh, the hydraulic rims was used to move the decades uh, six millimeters per four minutes, uh, each pier. So that, that makes, that made that they can do, do works on each piers. And uh, th th it was smart that they didn't use the crane to lift the, the decades to the piers because it, it was very hard to lift the decades several hundred meters high and put a curate point on the piers. Uh, so in one word, Milan Wheel Dots is a successful project for a reason or another or a combination of them. And in the end, FH was able to produce a high quality uh, product before the schedule date and uh, within the budget is, is the most important thing. And the successful BOT contract is another major factor in, in itself. And the lessons learned from this project can be utilized in the future mega urban transport project. Thank you very much. Great job, guys. I am fascinated uh, about uh, construction projects, and I thought it was an interesting fact uh, for this company to be building one of the tallest bridges uh, in, the, in the world, and yet uh, kind of ignore their geological uh, risk assessment. You know, it's kind of like building something on sand. It's like, so what? Let's, let's go for it. And I also found that your last uh, piece there about using concrete versus, or steel, uh, rather than concrete, it makes me question, um, yes, they could build it faster because of, you know, um, availability of the steel and, and prefabricating and those elements, but I kind of wonder the longevity of that bridge, you know, considering uh, some of the other risk uh, aspects that were ignored. Um, my question, though, is around uh, some of the lifts, they didn't test them or they didn't seems like they didn't do any prototyping uh, in this project and I just wanted to um, ask you about uh, how prototyping or piloting could be used in other industries outside of uh, construction. So can you give me an example of how, how uh, uh, prototyping or piloting in a technology project might be beneficial? That's a good question, thank you. Uh, the reason they had to go with prototyping here is because they didn't have any other option. And uh, they had outsourced this to NRPAC, and NRPAC was responsible for uh, coming up with a prototype which would be able to help, uh, which would be able to help push the deck uh, at such great heights. Uh, in technological projects, uh, prototyping can be used when there is uh, a necessity when, uh, because it is a risky one, uh, the, the, if, when you're using uh, something new in a project uh, which, you have, uh, which you don't have much information about, there is always some angle or scenario which cannot be evaluated. So uh, I will not be able to give an example for technological projects, but I would say that if, if we are prototyping in an industry uh, and if you're using that prototype in a project, then we need to do many tests. And compared to the amount of research that was done for Milau Viaduct, there was 10 years of research done before actually the construction began. Uh, it has a very big history around it. And with all this, uh, the prototype was not thought about. So this is a very surprising thing. Thank you. lessons learned for a successful project can be, you know, we oftentimes point out what went wrong, but also, too, we want to reflect on what worked well. So in your opinion, you know, you listed um, time management, they had good stakeholder management, they had clear risks for risk management, um, they took into consideration quality management, all these key, you know, areas of project management that they should have done. In your opinion, what was the number one thing that wasn't taken very well care of that 
that made the bridge collapse. The planning for the actual, you know, when the when the first tier collapsed, what part wasn't thought through so well? In your opinion, what was the one item that could have been done better to prevent the collapse? Or there was a landslide. A landslide. There was, Sorry, landslide. I was, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't collapse, but there was a landslide. A landslide, the landslide, yeah. Well, but if. Which one, which uh, one could have, which, what planning could have prevented the landslide? If, if I'm going to construct something in a place which is uh, where the ground is unstable or it is prone to landslide, I will definitely barricade it. And uh, the construction has to work around barrication. And I would say the most important thing here is that uh, it was present in the risk assessment plan because ge geologists had identified that there is a risk. But I would say it's the um, lack of leadership foresight or this has to be brought up in a white board meeting when, when, when all the leaders are sitting and they're looking at the risk assessment plan. Mm -hmm. uh, but they evaluated this risk having uh, maybe high probability but low impact or low probability, low impact. It is, uh, it is very speculative to say anything, ri anything right now. But that was the most important thing, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, even though uh, it's a very small thing, it doesn't mean it cannot happen. Mm -hmm. So if Which it is- responsibility was it to act on that risk? I would say the firstly, uh, it is the project manager mm -hmm. who, yeah. <laughs> stop it's, there. There you go. As soon as I say good answer, stop. <laughs> okay, Sylvie. Okay, so um, you said it was successful, and, but do you have sort of the data of what was planned? cost-wise and length-wise, and then what they ended up at? Do you have the... Uh, according to cost-wise, they, uh, they, had, they had to build the bridge in 300 million euros and the toll plaza in 20 million euros. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they were able to uh, build it with a little bit of margin, as in uh, the final numbers, nobody knows, but... Uh, what is out there is that they did not exceed the budget by a large margin. And uh, basically. basically, I would say the fact that they built the tallest bridge one month ahead of the schedule, it overshadowed everything else. And it got so, so was much. A month different from their initial yeah, they, they, the human resource management, as you see, was done for 39 months, but the bridge was finished in 38 months. Oh, okay. All right. Thank so, you. Yeah. So it sounds like ahead of schedule and maybe slightly over budget, but with uh, yeah. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Yes, at the back. Uh, toward the end of the presentation, you mentioned that they split the major team up according to their merit. I can see that it's kind of in, like uh, encourage internal comp competition like between teams so that they may go for higher quality, higher efficiency. But I, I also see there is obvious problem with this procedure, like the transition between manager from team to team, like there could be time wasted. And the, inter and the share of effective of the share of information when the new man come in and he need to grasp uh, the whole picture very fast. So what have the uh, project management team done to prevent all those things from hindering the successful execution of the project? Okay, uh, very good question. Uh, firstly, I would say yes, the major challenge was when there is a handover from one project manager to the other and uh, they had to uh, make sure this uh, particular task is done right. But apart from that, the uh, employee, I mean, leadership rotation was actually done to practice the uh, putting yourself in someone else's shoe strategy. And uh, the, the leaders, when, they, when, they, were, when uh, they were taking care of different aspects of the same project, they were able to appreciate different type of tasks, and uh, they were able to uh, be motivated, stay motivated, and uh, the same thing goes with the employees. When they were given their own peers to work on, there was no uh, complication, and uh, everyone had their, uh, their tasks very, I mean, tasks sorted out, and they were very clear what they had to do.
whole change on the one hand, and second, on organizational change of control. It did sound like the second one you spoke to because it sounded like there was a partial sale of the operating company partway through the bill. But any, any comments, observations on whether either of those risks had an impact or might have an impact in this kind of a feature fragile? Uh, the sale of the stakes, it was, uh, it was more of an opportunity analysis. They analyzed it as risk, but it had different uh, results for them. And uh, I would say this, is, this, this had always been the part of strategy, and it wasn't something which came up years later. And uh, this, this, this was their approach to uh, be able to take the financial risk. The GPS system. They <laughs> used the <laughs> GPS system. Focused on the project teams, not, not, not on the construction, but the, the coordination of the work and the effort among se nine separate project teams. Uh, the coordination, I would say, was uh, not required between the project teams because they were building their own peers and the project managers coordinated between each other to make sure that uh, the collective goal is reached. and. Uh, they had separate resources. The only thing that they had to coordinate for was the cement, which was built from a, a cement construction plant, which was right at the site. Uh, so they were able to maintain the quality as well as uh, make sure that the work is done on time. Very good. I guess that means something different now when you say you work for Pier 1. Huh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> do, I, do I have another question from the judges? Actually, I have one. I'm just thinking of the government of France and these guys coming to me and saying, we're going to build you this bridge. We've never done this before, and we're going to do it this way. So do you know how long it took before they actually made the decision and actually went with that approach with that contractor? And the financing was different, it seems, as well. So it would have taken a lot of convincing, I think, to me for something like that to happen. OK, thank you for the question. Uh, I would say you're right, because uh, the plan for making the bridge, it, it, it came out a long time back. Uh, it started in 1980 with the A75, and then uh, five years later, they had decided to uh, come up with a plan to uh, fix the gap between the valley so that Milau doesn't suffer. So first it was decided that it has to be a publicly funded project, and uh, then the French government realized that they didn't have the cash flow required and the expertise required to finish this project. And uh, they convinced the people with the, uh, uh, with number one, saying that uh, the taxpayer money will not be involved in this project and uh, it will be privately funded. And they called it the reputation effect. They said that if uh, they, were act they will be able to act better on a private concessionary than on, than on public roads in case if there is any emergency. And in summer, of, uh, in summer after the bridge opened, uh, the bridge was open on 16th December 2004 to the public, and in the, and in, and in the following summer, uh, there was so much traffic that they were, uh, the government was forced to oblige IFH to open new toll, uh, toll plazas as well as add new lanes. And they did that by reputation effect and by the pressure of being able to collect the tolls for another 70 years. Very good. Okay. I have time for one last question. Yes, go ahead. So the, uh, the landslide, mm -hmm. do you have details how they, uh, they, they looked at that and how, what's the impact on the structure of the bridge? Well, uh, the landslide fortunately didn't have much impact on the structure of the bridge, but doesn't mean it couldn't have caused the catastrophe. And uh, regarding the limestone uh, around the place, it was always known. Uh, the area is known for its uh, 
limestone deposits as well as the famous Rockford cheese that comes because of the bacteria that is in those limestones. So it was, it was known far along and uh, as I said, it is little surprising that the leadership did not take it into consideration. Thank you very much, great job.